today we're going to talk about the topic of uh, equal rights to education. Uh, that could be the topic of today. And our guest today is a 31-year-old political science uh, from Stockholm who founded a non-profit organization to provide computer education for children in Ghana. And Torsten, who's our guest today, Torsten Schellgren, he, he founded the current organization called IT for Children four years ago. And today that organization has grown to, it, it has grown in its capacity to be able to provide free education today for almost 2,000 students every day uh, or children in Ghana. And I'm all, always impressed when people kind of dedicate their, their time, energy um, to contribute to a bigger benefit for the collective. So I want to say a uh, warm welcome to this interview today, Toshnan. And uh, do you want to open up with the, where are you in your energy level? How are you today? Ah, thank you very much. I'm uh, I'm very excited to uh, to participate in this uh, interview. I must say. So uh, I have to say that uh, the energy is on top. Uh, very positive. Mm. That's a good sign, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you would explain IT for Children for someone who who doesn't know what it is, or um, how would you explain uh, the organization that you founded? I think the idea is quite simple. Then the uh, the way to get there was somewhat complicated. But the idea is simply that I think it's a human right uh, to have access to all the information that we take for granted in a country like Sweden. In mm. Sweden, 95% of the population, almost everyone, has daily access to internet and computer. We take it very much for granted. In Ghana, around 30% have access to computers and internet. And most of these people live in the big cities. So if you go to a small town or countryside in Ghana, uh, West Africa, nobody essentially has used a computer. Um, and this goes beyond age or education and stuff like that. So if you meet a 12 year old, 13 year old, they've never used a computer. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the sort of like gap of, of um, of justice and fairness that that made me kind of decide to we have to do something about this but then it was an absurd situation that gave me the idea to start the organization and that is that in Ghana they have mandatory IT education they have mandatory IT classes in school but they don't have any computers and most schools don't even have, have electricity so I visited a school in Ghana and I saw a teacher trying to explain to the students the students were around maybe 12 years old uh, how to use Excel and none of these kids I talked to them none of them have used or even seen a computer and they were supposed to learn how to use Excel looking at a textbook and the teacher was was talking and I thought this is so absurd how would anyone learn how could you how could you even try to understand how to use a computer if you never sit in front of a computer that's crazy. It's like trying to yeah. play football without the football. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So I thought it was so absurd. So that's actually how I got the idea. So we started very small scale in terms of collecting uh, refurbished uh, secondhand laptops in Sweden. You know, so many people are upgrading their laptops all the time. So we collect them mostly from friends, family and stuff like that. Ship them down to Ghana and essentially introduce computers for kids uh, in a small village called Busua where I already had a network of friends and people I could trust and people I could involve in the project. And now this has grown a lot. So now we're operating in, in two different villages where we built our IT academies. So uh, on the rooftops, we put on solar panels. So we're relying on renewable energy, which is also very much reliable in Ghana compared to the normal electricity grid, where it's just lights out all the time. And we've filled these classrooms with laptops from Sweden, donated from persons in Sweden, but also companies, schools. Uh, and then we providing IT education primarily uh, every day for free for 2,000 kids. Uh, and it's Ghanaian teachers, local teachers who are teaching them. Um, and then besides that, we're not, we're not only doing IT, but we're doing uh, a lot of things that will both improve uh, or help the kids in their in their schooling and in their education in terms of English, math, uh, science, all that. Uh, but also we have a lot of 
uh, things that we think can be uh, can sort of complement the, the regular schooling system in Ghana. That has to do with independent thinking, analytical thinking, and things like that. Um, but when we look at what we've achieved so far, uh, just looking at our students is quite remarkable. So the first class that we had was, I think, uh, late 2015. Um, and then we introduced computers for the first time. For, uh, then we had 30 students in a classroom. And the first task was how to turn on a computer. Mm. So the kids had to like, you know, identify uh, the power button and, and press it and turn on the computer essentially. And these same kids who are participating in this class now have developed their own games and uh, websites. So now they're sitting and coding in, uh, in Python uh, primarily. And they already, you know, master Excel and Word and internet for various things, just like any teenager in Sweden. Um, so that, that's quite remarkable. It's the same. I mean, they were, they were small kids back then and now they're teenagers, but it's the same kids and they know so much more <laughs> about mm. the world as well. Not only about computers, I would say. That's beautiful. It must be quite a journey to build like f the feeling of seeing that journey must uh, I'm guessing that would give you a lot of satisfaction too. Definitely, definitely. And I think uh, it will be even more satisfactory once once we follow these kids in the future and see how the how this skills and knowledge can help them in their lives, you know, in terms of supporting themselves, supporting their families, and maybe pursuing different dreams that they have, different interests um, and how they how it can help them in their uh, education or in their in their career um, that, that will be I think even even cooler but already it's it's quite remarkable when you see that it's it's the same kids it's the same individuals that were introduced so complete beginners a few years ago and now they they're very yeah very outstanding I would say in IT and have so much knowledge about the world and, uh, and also they've accelerated so much in their in their schooling as well so. What are the kids say, telling you? Um, do what's the response once they get this um, opportunity? Oh, yeah, it's very different kind of uh, response. Uh, of course, when I mean, like kids are so diverse and uh, it's different ages, right? So, well, our age, the, age, the ages we have for, for our students is between seven and fifteen. Mm. Uh, so essentially just following the, the, the schooling uh, system uh, and I think when we introduce the computers from the first time it's it's quite natural that it's very interesting especially uh, especially for kids who are maybe like nine or ten years old it's almost like a magnet you know that if you never use the computer and you get introduced to the computer it's it's naturally very interesting but then what to use it for can can mean a lot of different things and uh, interest can be very different of course so some kids have uh, have maybe been very uh, very taken by the fact that they can they can design things they can sit and, and play around in, in different designing programs whereas other kids have spent a lot of time maybe reading uh, about the world on Wikipedia or surfing around on Google Maps and and exploring the world so that they've, they've used they've used the computer I think for a lot of their own interest as well, uh, besides the fact that they've gotten proper education from, from our classes. But the response has been very positive uh, from the kids. Um, then of course, it's, sometimes it's, it's more uh, complicated, I would say, with, with the adults, because uh, especially if you're operating in a, in a small community like we are doing, some uh, especially older men with power uh, are, can can be a bit reluctant to, to change. And this is of course a major change, you know, that the kids suddenly have access to these things, that the kids suddenly um, become on a completely different level in terms of independent thinking, in terms of knowledge. And uh, we've, we've experienced that maybe local leaders are not always as excited as the kids. So but the power dynamics would shift. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I can I can just give a concrete example that before you know uh, these kids who had a huge potential, they would still in a, in Ghana. It's also very like um, hierarchical society. So in the classroom, if the teacher would tell them something, they would expect to be quiet and just accept whatever the teacher is saying, and that this is knowledge and this is this is the truth. And the same if they would go to a church and listen to the pastor that 
the things that the pastor is saying is the truth. Uh, you can't challenge that. You can't question that. But now a lot of our kids have learned how to maybe falsify or verify information. They heard something that didn't really make sense, and then they look it up online, and then they read about it, and then, yeah, that was actually not true. And then they have the tools now and the knowledge to kind of question authority. And uh, I think that's, that's quite... I mean, it's remarkable and, and it's really cool, but it's, it's also a very powerful tool. And, and uh, we have to be a bit careful, of course, with uh, how the local leaders are reacting to this. Um, yeah. So what started out as an, an idea of giving equal rights for IT education is now actually shifting uh, much more uh, when it comes to f- uh, the freedom of to be able to choose and think for yourself. That's, as you say, quite remarkable, yeah. Definitely, uh, and, I, and I think if I if follow up on that as well, I think a, a really big change as well has been the fact that uh, almost 50% of our students are girls, and uh, the gender roles in Ghana are very uh, very different from, from in Sweden. So a lot of, a lot of girls are uh, expected to help out a lot at home and expect to... Uh, at a very early age, help out the family to uh, essentially with with an income. So um, even though most most girls in Ghana go to school, right off the school they are usually expected to help out selling things on the streets or or things like that. Uh, and then when we come, we start a project and we say two hours a day off the school, we provide free IT classes. Come here. Then we felt also that some parents and some families, of course, expect their girls to come home straight away. Uh, and computers is not for them. It's, uh, they, they could accept that their sons would go there, but not the daughters. So that was also, I think, like challenging local society a lot, in a lot of ways. And we, we have to develop a certain model to, to solve that, which is essentially that we're stepping in and we are not only providing these classes for free, but we're helping a lot of girls in their education. We, uh, those girls who are coming to our classes every day and uh, and learning, they also get completely covered in terms of uh, school-related fees and, and medical expenses. So our organization is essentially paying for the school uniforms, for their books, if they get sick, uh, hospital bill, uh, vaccinations and things like that. And for our, from our perspective, that became kind of our strong argument towards their families and say, look, if if you are ready to support your girls going to school every day and learning these things, uh, we take care of the expenses, we pay for that. So you don't have to worry about that. And most of the families accepted that because the family still, most of the parents still want the girls to, to go to school. It's just a matter of that they felt before that they couldn't afford it, that, that, the girl, that they had so many expenses and the girls had to provide for the family financially. So, mm. so this is kind of our way to, to tackle that problem. So it really is affecting the culture. Now, what, what would be the biggest change that you've um, seen so far in cultural kind of change in this? Uh, it sounds like you're providing a lot of safety for a lot of these children. Yeah, I think maybe the, the gender perspective is very strong. You can, you can see it very, very clearly that these families now, some of these girls are extremely sharp and talented and, and skilled. And uh, it shifted the dynamics, I think, in the family. Maybe, uh, maybe... Some of these girls have, have brothers who are not super good in school and now their parents expect the girl to pursue, you know, to higher education and maybe get a really good job uh, more so than their son. And before they would just expect the girl to maybe after school just, you know, work in the house, help out in the house. So that, that's a really big shift. Um, but I think that the more long-term effects we will see later on, you know, when these kids who are now teenagers when they become adults, you know, what that means for local society, what that means for these individual and what it means for their families. I think it's, it's yet to see, you know, uh, maybe, maybe in a few years, if we can have a follow-up interview, we will see like the more, the more long-term effects of this. So you've been growing up in Sweden and Swedish education. Is there a difference for you in, in general when you, um, do you see differences in, in the way you're educating from how, they've been doing it in Ghana in a sense. Very much so, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of big differences. And I would say um, the thing I mentioned before uh, briefly is the, the hierarchical society in Ghana, the, the authority that the teacher has in the classroom is, is very different from, from how it looks in Sweden. And then things that we have 
completely forbidden and abandoned in Sweden is still um, used and enforced every day in Ghana, which is essentially caning kids, uh, beating up kids. Um, of course, this is something we ban completely from day one in our facilities, in our academies. There is no violence. There is no even a threat to violence. But in the regular schools, when the kids go to school, the teacher is always uh, carrying around a cane in the classroom, and this is awful. This is disastrous, and they're not even ashamed of using it. So if you, as a visitor, would visit a classroom, sit down there, you know, check out a math lesson in uh, in middle school or in, in primary school, the teacher would give a math problem and ask one of the students to answer it, and. Uh, the student is trying, but get it wrong, get the result wrong. The teacher will cane the kid, using the, the, the cane to beat up the kid. And first time I saw this, this is a shock. And, you know, you get this kind of like cold, crippling feeling in your whole body that this is so sick, this is so absurd. But you can't really do anything when you're sitting there as a stranger, as a visitor in the classroom. That's, that's, their, that's what, what they're doing. Uh, it's awful. Um, but what we can do is that we can make sure uh, that this does not happen in our classrooms. Um, and I think we've seen a really big change uh, in how sort of like how our students are um, sort of absorbing knowledge. That's one thing, but also um, how they behave in the classroom. So in the beginning, most of our students were very quiet, very terrified of making mistakes, very afraid of asking questions, which is quite difficult if you're introducing something completely new, even if it's IT or math or whatever it is. If you're afraid of doing mistakes, if you're afraid of asking questions, it will be very difficult to progress and to learn. Uh, and they were essentially afraid of doing that because they've been taught in their schooling system, in their educational system, that if I do mistakes, if I say the wrong thing, I will be beaten up. They, they, will, they will beat me. Um, but now, especially those, those students that we have been coming every day for, for four years, now we can see that they're, they're way more confident in our classroom. They, if they don't understand something, they raise their hand and they ask a question. I don't understand. Can you, can you explain this to me? They're not afraid of uh, saying the wrong thing or trying new things. Uh, so this is, this is really, a, it's a remarkable shift. But I still can't guarantee that they will behave like this in their own class. I mean, if they have just like a regular class with a regular teacher who's standing there with a cane, I'm not sure that they, they are at that confident in that context, you know. But at least they know that there is one forum every day uh, where they not only accessing information and knowledge and learning new things, but they're safe. They can sit there and they're safe. Uh, mm. And I think that's, that's something that I'm really proud of, that we've been able to create that in these when, two villages. When you're sharing this, it's really easy to understand why this is so much more than just education. It's uh, providing an alternative for another kind of life uh, for these children. Yeah. Mm. I want to ask you, um, people who would like to support your organizations, if people, for example, would donate money like for funding, mm. uh, what can people expect from $1 or $10? For example, $10, what could people expect mm. for that amount? Uh, for ten dollars, it's uh, a very um, it's a very substantial amount. It does, it's not so much money in uh, maybe a European or American context, but in Ghana, it's 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 a lot of money for us. So um, what we would use amounts like this for is essentially uh, enabling more girls to go to school. So what I mentioned before is that we have these scholarship programs, and we call it our digital leader scholarships. So girls who are coming to our classes every day, girls who are willing to learn new things in IT, they get supported. So we're covering their, their medical expenses. Whenever they get sick, we pay for it. They need a vaccination against polio, diseases like that. We pay for it, malaria, whatever it is. School uniforms, books. But also now we're providing them school lunch. So like nutritious food for lunch so they're not going hungry to our classes, which we saw before. So $10 is more than enough for uh, two girls, I would say, per month uh, with these expenses. So you may, with, with $10 a month, you will make sure that two girls uh, who would otherwise maybe be forced to work out, work a lot at home and help out selling things on the street would instead get access to good education uh, and progress in, in their lives. And maybe in the, la in the later on also pursue their dreams, whatever it is to, to, to realize them. Um, so, so that's, 
yeah, that that goes goes way beyond just like a lunch. That would be kind of like the the equivalent in Sweden with with ten dollars. <laughs> it puts things in perspective. Uh, <laughs> you could change a, a girl, two girls' lives for a month versus yeah. uh, a lunch in Sweden. Yeah. Um, do, to end this today, is there anything do you would like to more people to understand um, about um, um, basically um, is there anything that you think is important that people understand about your cause or education in in general in Ghana or yeah I think uh, you know it, it's 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 been a it's been a real interesting right? a lot of challenges that we had to overcome and we started very small scale and and uh, and continue and now we've been we've been achieving way more but i think also there's a lot of side things that are not that we didn't we didn't think about it when I, when i started a project it's it's more these kids that we thought about right that they should get access to this education but what we see now is also all the jobs that we created in on the countryside small towns in ghana where unemployment is really high a lot of people are struggling finding a job and without a job you can't support yourself you can't support your family so we've created a lot of teaching jobs we also created a lot of jobs in construction security maintenance cleaning all these things that i didn't think about so much when we started but now we can see that these people have gotten jobs a lot of them were unemployed before and now they have a way better life than when we started you know and it's not charity we're not giving them money donations here buy something to food they, they do a really important work and they get paid a really good salary for it and now they can support their families and they can make sure maybe that their kids pursue higher education and get good jobs so i think these these effects are are also very very cool to follow and i didn't see it coming when we started but now we can really see it on so many jobs that we created hmm. the work you've been doing uh, it's truly inspirational for me i um mm. I wonder where I can find more people <laughs> who would dedicate that much of um, your life to this cause. So thank you for doing that. Um, I I really hope that uh, it seems to me that it's a natural expansion uh, that you've been seeing, and I'm I'm just guessing that's gonna just continue. Uh, so uh, best of luck for for this project, and uh, yeah, do you want to say any last words in this interview for? today oh thank you very much it's it's it was really fun to to be part of this uh of this interview and for anyone who's listening to this who's more interested in what we're doing in ghana and uh who maybe want to help out in one way or another just feel free to shoot me an email so toshten at itforchildren.org um and i'll be happy to answer any questions you have about the project or about ghana or about uh about whatever kind of so feel free to do that mm.